Okay, hello there, everyone. So we're going to hear what I use sort of day to day in my troubleshooting. Let me just give you my credentials very quickly. First of all, having worked in this EU space for 25 years now, so I've done a lot of troubleshooting in that time. But before that, I was a C++ software developer, writing device drivers, application software, and so on. So I brought those two skills together, if you like, with PowerShell, which is troubleshooting, but also trying to automate it. Why automate it? Why PowerShell? Well, let's not dwell on this slide. Well, first of all, we can run it interactively. So I'm not telling you today how to write scripts. Yeah, there's plenty of stuff out there that will allow you to do it. I'm talking about using it interactively as a as a console, like we do uh, sometimes with that, that legacy CMD thing, which uh, is not a DOS prompt. And we can also search that history, as we'll see. But there's lots of third-party scripts that you can use anyway if you want to, if you're not to uh, show this stuff yourself and that's a good way to learn that's how i learned programming back in uh, 1980 when i guess some of you weren't even around i took existing programs understood them modified them to do uh, what i needed them to do but if you're going to use anything you get off the internet just got to say uh, please do check they're not uh, full of nasty things either accidentally or deliberate again it's great for lazy people like me because we can we can tab complete everything we don't need to remember stuff because at my age I tend to forget stuff well at least I think I do I can't remember and there's a lot of command looks out there you know for both built into you know, Windows Windows 10 Windows Server OS's but also then from lots of um, third-party vendors you know VMware Citrix particularly in this uh, EUC space and once you get the basics of it, you know, hang in there. Sometimes it's a bit difficult, but it's you know, like riding a bike or uh, social distancing. When you get used to it, it's actually very easy. So you can just reuse the same skills. And we've got these aliases and it makes it much easier to type things, as we'll see. I'll be using aliases in the slides, mainly just so I can fit stuff onto them. Don't use them in scripts, though, because it can make things much more difficult to understand. But again, with tab completion, it's not that much you know, more difficult to type something like get dash process compared with you know, something like PS. And then we can get data in and out to lots of uh, you know, common formats very easily. Again, without having to do any work really ourselves, it's all built in. So again, like I say, great for lazy people like me. So let's go on to the uh, top 10 or uh, 0xa if we're talking in hex so those are the top 10 that i tend to use obviously pulling them together is quite difficult you'll see a mixture of actual troubleshooting ones and ways of getting data in and out and and, and formatting it you may i guess some of you know powershell so you know some of these some maybe not uh, again follow my twitter i do a lot of uh, one-liners there to help troubleshoot you know i like to try and share my knowledge those those aren't in any particular order so again time is of the essence here so let's crack on so first of all wai or cim as it's known from powershell version 3 on was the common information model but don't call it kim because uh, yeah that upsets a few people so cim what is it it's a it's a standard not just a microsoft standard to to get information from things what sort of information well over 800 uh, built-in classes by default again vendors can add their own and again just to make it easy for us we can start tab completing things so we can actually see what classes are out there we don't have to use some google or anything to look stuff up so i can just do a, a get cim class if you've only got access to version 2 well upgrade if you can but if not sometimes you have know, customers won't uh, do that for you then you have to slum it with get wmi object which is not massively uh, different to be honest with you same classes anyway some classes uh, will have methods that can be called so win32 user profile will give you the local profiles on a on a server again i've got some scripts on my github repository that uh, will go and show you the scripts, the sizes, and allow you to, to remove ones that you don't need. Um, and again, they're removed simply by calling a method on that particular profile, rather than having to go and figure out how to, to delete the files, where the files are, and so on. When we're filtering, and this is true for all sorts of queries, uh, AD queries, as we'll see later, as well as uh, CIM queries, we try and filter as left as possible. What does that mean? It means we retrieve as small amount of data as possible rather than filtering it later. So if I've got a million AD 
records. I don't want to fetch them all back and then filter them. I'd rather filter them in that very first course or perhaps only bring a hundred or a thousand back. But again, don't worry about it to start with because the important thing for any script is it does what it sets out to do. If it runs a bit slower or takes a bit more memory, it's not the end of the world as long as it does what you need it to do. No one's going to mark you on it or laugh at you for a script that works. And the beauty of CIM, and I use this a lot in my troubleshooting when I'm doing health checks or customer systems, it can actually take an array of machines, which is a comma separated list. So I can just say, go and check machines, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and bring all this data back, and it will bring them back into a, you know, a single entity such as a, a CSV. So that I can then look at it afterwards, particularly when I don't have access to those systems. So that's on GitHub. Uh, again, these, these slides which are made available afterwards have got lots of references to those uh, those scripts in them. And as we'll see in a, shortly in a little bit of demo, the, there are other namespaces. I don't have SCCM in my lab because I'm not a glutton for punishment, but I do have Citrix, so we'll see some of that. So let's go actually go and run some uh, let's go and run some queries. So let me go and find a PowerShell window, which I've got lots around in lots of different sessions. Uh, it's just a case of remembering which one to use. So here's one running locally on my Win10 laptop. So for instance, here I'm looking at the Win32 service class. Guess what? Which is services. There are built-in commandlets, which you mentioned later within PowerShell, get dash service and so on. But that doesn't give you all the information back that you need sometimes, such as the full path to the executable and command line options. And then I can say the caption, because we don't actually use the name, as we'll see in this data. So I'm gonna go and get all my VMware services. And there are names, but you know the names, some of those don't really mean anything, do they? So, because that's a name rather than a caption. But then I can say, well, actually I'm gonna select the, the name and the caption. Yeah, select being again actually an alias short for select dash object so there we see the caption which is what you see in the services uh, msc applet for instance so that was that one again with the filters this is a, a uh, where I'm talking about filtering left. So what I filter in the very first query rather than getting stuff back and then putting it back through a, a where object. So where caption is like VMware afterwards, because in that case, I would get all of the services back, which if you've got a small number of objects, doesn't matter. But when you've got a large number of objects, that can make quite a bit of difference in speed and memory footprint. Again, we can tab complete the class name. So if we come back over here, let's clear the screen, uh, get CIM instance minus class win32. Let's see what starts with a P. Page files, patches, etc. So we can tab complete those very nicely, very easily. So we don't need to know anything. We can also use get CIM class if we need to, which uh, I mentioned shortly, to actually see what classes are available. So uh, let's pick some things CIM class minus. Class name, star, process. What have we got? Oh, look, quite a, quite a few of those as well. So you can start to explore things. That's one of the things I do is go and see, oh, what interesting, I use the word interesting loosely, so um, uh, classes are available that could be useful for, for troubleshooting. And like I said before, there's, there's different namespaces as well. So these all earlier examples will use the default namespace. But if I then switch to a Zenapp session, uh, using a query I prepared earlier, there we go. So I'm going to query a Citrix HDX namespace for a particular class. And again, you know, those classes, if I just delete a few characters, you, know, you see I'm tab completing those as well. So you can just experiment. If you want to, if you don't know what you're looking for, sometimes some of these things, there's not a huge amount of documentation. So you're a bit on your own and there I'm getting a rich amount of information about the actual session properties. If I needed such a thing for you know, writing scripts or otherwise, or just investigating, this user says, you know, they haven't got this particular uh, feature. Let me go and have a look using uh, CIM to actually interrogate that session, forgetting you know, that if the Citrix policies may not have applied or whatever. As I said before, we can remote to a number of different machines. Some useful classes, well, process is useful. Again, we get various bits of information we don't get from get-process. 
this is one I use a, a heck of a lot, a Win32 operating system, and look at the last boot up time. One thing to note with uh, PowerShell is, you know, let's say I do a get Kim instance, which is GCIM for short, mine is class name, Win32 operating system. Where's this last boot time? Because it's not in its default output, but I can just go, uh, oops, select last, and I always go last boo because that brings a small smile to my sad face. And I can say that was when it was uh, that that's when it was last booted. So I use that a number of my scripts, to, for instance, to health check to see if things are being. Guy, are you there? Guy, are you there? I think we lost your audio. Guy, I think we lost your audio. Are you there, Guy? Now? Yeah, I can hear you. Excellent. You are right. back. Claudia, has he lost? It was just 15 seconds. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, I've plugged it, plugged it in again, turned it off and on. Uh, yeah, you probably didn't miss anything particularly interesting other than yeah, don't use Win32 product because it's not passive, and you'll see event log entries saying that you've uh, the Windows installer has modified a product, which is quite scary in a, a change control environment. Okay, so we move on to event logs. Now, of course, we all know there's well over 300 event logs. So rather than just looking application system, if we're looking for a problem or looking for hints as to why a log on might be slow, we've got a heck of a lot of um, event logs to go through, haven't we? Because we've got so many of those. Yep, yeah, you know what I mean? By uh, all those down on this side over here. So all in the applications and services section is, uh, like I say, typically 300 plus. Or 388, I did that yesterday, it was 389, I've lost one somewhere. We can actually see what providers we've got, uh, either just through a simple asterisk, which will list every single provider we've got, or if you're looking for a particular provider, let's say for uh, terminal services, you know, get, Dash win events slash list log star terminal. Don't you love live demos? There we go. Terminal services. So I know I've got various terminal services log, and some of those, the interesting things in, notice the record count. If it's zero, well, there's nothing in there, but we use quite a lot of that in some of the control up scripts to get information about the log on out of. And then what we can do is nicely um, pull stuff into a into a grid view, which again is in the in the top ten of uh, troubleshooting applets. Not because it gets data itself, but because it allows us to then manipulate the data we get back. So if I use Control R now, so I hit Control R, and I'm going to go uh, if I can actually type, which it looks like I can't. Go and look there. So here's a command I prepared earlier which uh, I use rather a lot of my troubleshooting, although I've got a, a, a script wrapped around it to make it a bit easier, again, available on GitHub. This will go and get all event logs. The question mark is short for where, so where the record count is greater than zero. And it's using what's called a filter hash table. Uh, so I can go and tell it what particular log, the start time. So I'm, I'm using today, so I don't need to specify a date, but if it was yesterday or 10 days ago, if my event logs are big enough, I'm going to specify a date in there, end time, select all the fields, bring them all together by sorting on the, the time created, and then I'm using an alias there, OGV, which is out grid view. So what I should have done is actually hit enter at the start there, uh, and I'll probably come back to that one in a moment because that will take a couple of minutes. 
or if you want oh in fact it's come back already and that's why i only picked a very short period of time uh then we see that information there already again the, the columns aren't initially ordered in the perhaps the way we want them but we can get rid of all sorts of uh columns that we don't want again this is built into powershell and outgrid view so i don't need to write any window stuff myself to be able to get something which is sortable and filterable if i move time created up bang there we go so i can see stuff here i can see what event log they've come from over on the right because i'm using small screen resolution we'll see that there are uh you know, errors warnings etc and i can filter on those because this now allows me to to filter so I could say if the let's which one should we filter on level display name add contains error do we have any errors no we didn't have any errors in that time so it's probably all just informational stuff I can sort things uh, but all straight out of PowerShell so I've not had to write anything myself so I use outgrid views a lot if you don't like that or you want to keep the data for later use export csv which uh, guess what exports it to a csv then you can take that information away and filter it in excel or google sheets later but it means you then you've actually got it for a later period and we can remote that as well so it actually takes a computer name argument so i don't even need to log on to machines or i can actually pull data from a number of different machines you know, let's say i've got you know 10 zen app servers let me go and pull data for this particular period from all 10. so we've seen these already again i'm using select there to say actually i want to see the the the, the most recent 10 application errors from the event log there's one i just uh, just showed you again in the slide deck so afterwards you can literally copy and paste that if you want so changing the times to what you need filtering uses these things called hash tables or dictionaries if you may know them from other languages again pretty easy to to construct uh, and just a quick note there that sometimes it's better to to use the properties in an event uh, well i mean that uh just bear with me a minute let's bring this one over so you know typical event log here's a process start event which are very very useful to have so you can do a lot of uh, a lot of auditing so that's quite a big message but if you look at the details and event data this these are all the properties so in the example in that slide properties five is zero one two three four five is the new process name so i don't have to parse all of that text it's just an efficiency thing so that's where i've got the properties there's five there so i have to go through it's a rate of knots because trying to fit 10 and demo uh, all into 45 minutes is uh, quite difficult so PowerShell kind of remoting is is built in which is very useful so that you can do things centrally for one machine to reach out to others and uh, do things from a central point as long as we've got uh, the remoting set up so we can run WinRM quick config if it's not set up as an admin and one of my say favorite um, Command lets is this enter PS session. What's that allow me to do? Well, it allows me to get a an interactive, albeit text only, uh, prompt onto another machine. So a bit similar to you know Telnet or SSH in sort of uh, Unix world, and also onto networking kit. But it's a, particularly if you know you can't log onto a machine, users say, "Well, my session's hung," and you try an RDP to it, and it, you still can't get on because that an RDP MSTSC session is quite uh, resource intensive, then we can probably get on with uh, enter PS session. So again, if we nip back to my Citrix session, and then let's, oh, wrong session, too many things to demo. Uh, let's bring that one over. <laughs> Yeah, so there we go. Enter PS session. So again, using Control R to search the uh, history. And again, as long as you've got a persistent profile, that history is persistent across sessions if you log out or even if you reboot. So I've now actually got a session onto a, another machine. Um, and again, I could be using Control R in this one as well. So I can't remember what I want to look for. Uh, I should have probably used Control R, shouldn't I? Yes, I should. So. 
uh, operating system, that's what I wanted. So here I am on to, I've gone from a server 2016 to a, a Windows 10 enterprise machine. What can I do here? Well, I can see its processes. So if something was, you know, take a lot of CPU, so I could sort that on CPU if I wanted to. And let's just look at the, the top 10. Except I've not done it descending, schoolboy error. There we go. Uh, okay, so we can see some processes have taken quite a bit of CPU and troubleshoot those. And I say one of the things I tend to use it quite a lot for is remote prop mon. So if you've got a Windows 10 logon that you want to monitor, Obviously, you can't be logged on interactively as an admin at the same time that like you can on a, a server OS. So you can actually run Propmon lights out. So you know, Propmon with a, a backing file argument and accept EULA. So it doesn't prompt you in a dialog box you won't see for accepting the end user license. A, a quiet. So it doesn't prompt you. You, you run that. Some, you can give it a runtime if you want. Number of seconds or because that will come back. Once you've done your log on or got to the point where you want to stop monitoring, you can just give it a, a slash terminate. And again, all from a, a start dash process from from here. It's all very easy. Again, if you search my uh, Twitter feed, you'll see that there's a uh, a couple of tweets around how to use Propmon uh, in this lights out way so that you'll get a PML file that you can load in. So that's what I love about uh, enter PS session. We have reboot machines and so on restart services, etc., etc., or through a very simple uh, mechanism. And then if you're doing it in a script, then you can create these sessions and uh, it, use invoke command through that session, rather than have doing invoke command to create a new session every time you want to run something in a remote session, it's just quicker. And if you're going to use store credentials in scripts, please store them securely. Uh, again, I've, I've got a few tweets out about how to do that and some scripts which do uh, store them in a secure manner. So testing networking. How do we test networking? Well, let me ping something. Yeah, ping's a great test, isn't it? No, not really. It tells me that it can resolve something and somebody has enabled ICMP. But other than that, how do I know if a port's alive? Well, this is where test-net connection comes in. Similar, if you like, to Telnet, not Telnet in the sense of where we've just sent into PS session, but Telnet, you know, typically an admin would install so that they can send Telnet to a particular uh, TCP port on a machine to live. Now, Telnet to port 80, Telnet to port 443. All right. Yeah. And we have a question here from a good friend, Manbinder from Citrix. So, in terms of security, are there any considerations in terms of VinRAM that you are seeing when you're visiting customers by enabling that? Is it a risk or what's your standpoint on that? Well, it's it's secure by design. Yeah, so unless you're in the local admins group, you're not going to be able to, to remote to things. So a normal user won't be able to uh, use remoting. Okay. And you, can, Excellent. you can further lock it down, or you can allow users to remote if you want, but it's not that way by default. Thanks, Ambinder. So, what can we do with test net connection? Well, let's say we can test a port. If you actually use it with no arguments other than a computer name, it will do a ping. Uh, but like I say, there's not really a great deal of benefit in that. So, we can do a particular port. So, if I uh, wrong one, if I pick yet another window. Too many windows open. Should have closed a few down. That's the bunny. Um, so again, let's move it onto the screen where you can actually see it. That'd be useful, wouldn't it? So let's test dash. So there's a, a test dash net connection. So I'm just going to see if I can get to one of my vCenter boxes on port 80. It comes back saying it's true. If it, trying to get to somewhere where it wouldn't Haven't quite got to that number yet then well, I get a warning which I could suppress if I wanted to and it just comes back with that uh, I can also do things like trace routes as well within it so that will actually go and 
go to uh, the BBC, good old BBC, and then see if it can, uh, yeah, so you can see all the hops there as well and some numbers. But these are coming back as objects, so it's not like you do a ping in a CMD and you have to parse the output. So I can say dollar test equals. And then when I come back, I can, I can say, well, actually, what? What is in dollar test? Which is, again is this almost made it into the top ten. Get dash member tells me what's available. So properties, which are uh, we'll we'll see, and those are the sorts of things that we saw in that output, but also methods to do things. So I could say there's TCP test succeeded. So I could say dollar test. But again, I don't actually need to know it. I you know, as soon as I type dot, I can start tab completing. Yeah. So get member is a great way to explore stuff that you've not necessarily used before. So I use it a lot. So that means it failed. So that's you know, a test net, net connection. So it's not like with a telnet or ping or something like that in the old days of CMD or batch scripts where I'd actually have to parse some text. Again, it's all object based. And there's an alias for it. So use aliases on the command line because it's marginally quicker, but don't use them in scripts. TNC, because if you saw TNC in a script, you think, what the heck is TNC? Okay, continuing this whirlwind tour, when I get through all 10 will be uh, remarkable, but I'm gonna give it a good shot. And of course the slides will be available afterwards anyway. So with Active Directory, you can use something called ADSI if you want where you don't necessarily have the Active Directory module. Some of my control at scripts use ADSI because we can't guarantee that customers will have the Active Directory PowerShell module where we need it, but it's very easy to add with one line if you need to. Uh, again, I've added it to a custom machine I was working on this morning. So if you use the stuff, why use PowerShell? It's a hell of a lot quicker, particularly if you haven't got access to AD users' computers. Uh, you can do stuff, you certainly, uh, well, you can change stuff if you want, but you can certainly get information very quickly on a particular user. You know, that will just return me a small amount of information. So again, let's just clear this out. Control R again to search. So for instance, I'm already jumping into uh, some filters there, so I can go and show me all my users who are not enabled. Uh, of course, that's because I'm in that, notice I'm in that session still, but my prompt starts at uh, view CLI, but I was just uh, testing myself there and I passed that test fortunately. So we can see all my disabled users, but if I wanted them in a, in a nicer format, I could pass it through format table or FT for short, or I could put it into a, uh, one of those nice grid views, or I could port it, put it into export dash CSV to give to a report to management. I can, yeah, I could query on when people last logged in. So there's a whole load of stuff I can do without needing any sort of third party uh, products like Quest or whatever. And then I can actually re you know, restrict the search to a particular OU if I wanted to. And then I can start to change properties as well. So if I need to do a bulk change of a home directory, for instance, that's something I've done for a customer before now, then I can I can do it in a PowerShell script rather than some poor person having to manually do it in AD users computers. And then we can start to look at group membership, either checking it or changing group memberships. All very easy with the Active Directory module. And there's a... Uh, shed load of scripts out there internet to do it already. Okay, moving on, get dash process. Yeah, because processes tend to be the things that cause us problems, either because of what they're doing or not doing or not existing. So uh, we've seen this one already actually in one of the earlier quick demos. So we can see how much CPU it's consumed. So that's the overall consumption bigger that you'd see in task manager. So that particular CPU time column. So again, when I'm jumping on some customer machines, I will generally add this column and sort on CPU time. So to see what has used the most CPU, because if someone says, oh, this machine's running slowly, and you'd lo log on and it's you know, very, barely using any CPU, that will give you a better indication of what has used CPU since the last boot. Uh, again, very useful to know whether something has started and when it started with respect to other things, such as boot time. So we've seen how to get boot time through CIM. Again, just do a get process, pipe through it and look at the uh, the start time property. So we can actually see when it started. 
has it you know has it restarted do i need to use get dash win event to look for events in event log to say a, a particular service has died or maybe someone's actually manually restarted it uh chrome yeah it doesn't use much memory does it never many processes so here what we can do is actually use the measure dash command which i've used the alias just for measure so actually go and uh sum all of the the working set properties and show me the uh the answer in megabytes so again i don't just get some large number that uh i've got to then convert in my head and make sure i don't miss yeah I'd get it out by a factor of 10 so again control r let's have a look for in fact that's the wrong one it's probably too many uh too many PowerShell prompts, but notice actually what I do is tend to uh, label them so their titles are have their process IDs in them, whether 64 bit, the version, when they were launched. Again, that's all part of my PowerShell profile. So there we go PS, which is short for, which is actually uh, from uh, Linux or Unix, but that's short for get dash process. So I'm going to Get the sum of all those and then convert to megabytes. So Chrome at the moment is only using 221 meg, and that's actually because I'm using Edge as my main browser at the moment. So that's a, a, an easy way of figuring out how much uh, working set memory is being used. Here we can see how much uh, memory uh, McAfee is using. I use that one because I noticed a custom machine yesterday got 1.2 gig of McAfee processes, which on a 4 gig machine is uh, yeah quite a lot. So again, there we're summing the working set, but this time where the path of the process has got McAfee in. That, friends, is a regular expression, but it's not a scary one. Uh, user Fred, who's been known to run quite a lot of stuff, what's what's he running on there? But I must run that elevated. That's one thing to note when you use the minus include username. What version of, in this case, is, is Acrobat? Uh, is Acrobat running? So again, not something I can actually see from Task Manager. So am I running the right version for that particular user? Are we running all the same versions on this particular machine? Um, again, this is one I put out on Twitter only last night. Uh, let's say you need to update MF App Hook, actually Citrix DLL, but it says it's busy in the installer. What's using it? Well, in the old days, or manually, you might use something like Processes Internals, Process Explorer to search for that. Here, we can actually just do it again through uh, PowerShell, albeit that would be run elevated. So, because part of the uh, property set returned by get process is a an array of all the modules, DLLs that that particular process is using. I think next time I'll do the top five, Eric. Tends too many for 45 minutes, but I'm probably going to turn this into a one day training course anyway. Watch this space. Get child item you probably use already, if you, even if you don't realize it, with uh, PowerShell because get child item is the as an alias of DIR. So if I type you know, DIR, then that's what people are used to from uh, from CMD, but actually that's alias. If we scroll up, you'll see that it's actually a uh, where are we? There we go. DIR is actually an alias for get child item. So we can do all sorts of things with um, get child item. Again, perhaps a little bit of advanced PowerShell here. We're using that at uh, curly braces stuff is using a, a calculated property. So rather than again, just showing sizes in bytes where you've got to do that uh, conversion in your head, I'm actually doing that conversion here where I'm taking the length which is the length in bytes and converting to uh, to megabytes. So I'm going to go find the largest 10 files because I'm sorting on a descending length here in the particular folder where I'm running this from. So you know, what's taking up all that disk space? Or here, I'm actually going to do it down a whole folder structure. So I might, that might be the whole of the C drive or the whole of somebody's um, profile. I can also you know, sum up the whole, rather than looking at individual files, this allows me, again, using that measure command we saw before for summing working sets, here I'm summing those lengths. So, uh, you know, a disk usage tool, albeit in PowerShell. Again, I've got this in a, an Explorer add-on, so you can do a, a send to folder size. Uh, again, that's on GitHub. Find all the files from a specific vendor. 
probably won't find that many Novell files on systems these days. But this is where we're looking at the version info. So we can even look at you know, version numbers and, and that sort of side of things to make sure I've got the right versions or all the versions of DLLs and so on for a particular product match. Those who know my background with uh, AppSense and Avanti will hopefully understand about uh, trusted owners. So is there something in this particular folder that perhaps shouldn't be? So again, here's uh, an example. So if I go to uh, Windows System 32, uh, again, use my search. So this is, just bring that over so it fits on the screen. So that's that same query. So I'm gonna get the access control list, the ACL, using get child item, which we're using the alias, but where the owner is not the administrator, not system or not the hello, trusted hello. installer. Hello, hello, yeah. Hello, you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Uh, I right, was sorry. Sound check. Yeah. Some... <laughs> right, thanks. So that's not going to go off and find anything and tell me. So where is doing a checking and oh, look, I've got something called, um, oh, mimicats.exe. That's probably not too good. Owned by uh, somebody called Guy L in my system 32 folder. Yeah, that's not good. So I can start doing you know, automated security scans via PowerShell scripts in scheduled tasks, for instance, to find uh, nasty things, which maybe my AV software hasn't even caught for me. But it doesn't have to be just a file system for get child item. We can also use other what are called PowerShell drives or PS drives. So we have things uh, we can check, for instance, notice in here we've got a certificate drive. So I can actually check certificates. I can check what's going to expire in the next number of days. We've got the registry, so I can check for registry keys, registry values, either check them, delete them, change them. So there's a whole load of different things there. So there's a query that will bring back all certificates in my local machine store, which are going to expire in the next 60 days. Again, easy enough to remote across multiple machines. Again, I've got a script on GitHub for doing that. Deleting old log files. Again, very easy. Here we can say I'm just doing a, a DIR of a good old IIS log files where the creation time is less than the current date, less than 30 days ago. So anything older than 30 days, it shows them and I could pipe that into remove item and I've got myself a, a way of removing old log files. Again, put that in a scheduled task. Your disk won't fill up again because of uh, those log files being forgotten about. And for those of you with fat fingers like me, uh, Set alias, so if I type, how many times have you done that? Dry instead of DIR, what a look. <laughs> yep, so that's what aliases can do for you. Put them in your profile, you don't have to set it every time. All right, I'm just about running out of time, haven't I? Oh, I'll crack on. So another couple of um, commandlets that can help you uh, to get help. Yeah, what is the, uh, there are thousands of commandlets, but which ones were gonna help me? Well, which ones are to do with networking for setting networking? Well, I want to set one. So get get command GCM verb set noun network. That will show me all of the uh, all of the network ones. One or two or I can just do. If I want. Yeah. How many were those? I wasn't counting them, but hey, we all know about measure now. Oh, there were 50 of those. So I can see what commands there are. I can see what commands are in a particular module. So what does the Active Directory module actually give me? Well, get command from that particular module. It'll tell me. And I could use verb set if I wanted to, or I could use star user. It will also find the you know, executables. Or for the same matter, I could actually start TS and then hit tab. And that will go through all the yeah, TS ones, for instance. I just picked TS or control space. And we can do this for options as well. Shows everything available. And I can actually then use the cursor keys to go and pick the one I want. And the same is true of options. So if I do a get dash process minus and then control space, 
I can go and pick the ones I want. And if you notice bottom left, it even tells you the, the type of the argument. And yeah, PowerShell is designed to be easy, it really is. Which is why sometimes I find it painful to go back to have to go back to VBS or CMD now. Again, we can even pattern match even further. So this will this will bring back cert commands, MSCs, and Xs, and get help, which will tell you how to use these. Show window in a separate window, or online, we'll actually go to web pages if they've been set up. The uh, the VMware Power CLI is very good for that. And then, as I think I showed you earlier, we can pipe to get member to actually show what I can do. Export CSV, I've talked about already, not showing you an example, but you've all seen CSVs before. If you're Dutch, don't forget to use minus uh, delimiter to a semicolon, because CSVs are uh, SSVs, it would seem, in, uh, in Holland, as I found when I was doing some work over there. Don't put them into Unicode, because Excel doesn't like it. So we can produce reports scheduled. Uh, again via uh, Windows scheduled tasks and then actually automatically send them via an SMP, SMTP email server to uh, recipients and then we can then take that data and bring them back into scripts if you want to or uh, convert CSV like data like IIS logs so again I've got a, a couple of scripts and some uh, one-liners on github to show you how to get IIS logs into a grid view that we've seen already and that's a beautiful way of visualizing, sorting, filtering. Oh, what error 500s have I got? Or oh, what have I got from this particular IP address? And so on. Outgrid view, again, we've seen. We can also give it a minus pass through. So it puts the output into something. So either into the clipboard, into a variable, or you can paste it into Notepad, or pipe it into uh, another commandlet, such as you know, remove item. Let's pick some files and then click OK and, uh, and delete them. Just make sure you know what you're doing. And I think, Eric, have I, have I pretty much run out of time or not? Have I got a bit of time left? Or is you everybody falling are asleep? One minute. One minute. Hey, that's not too bad. So I knew I wouldn't get through everything. So there are some extra slides in here for your delectation uh, once we finish. So hopefully there'll be, a, there'll be a useful resource. But they, here are some of the ones that I almost got into the top 10. Some I've already mentioned anyway. So we've seen measure command. Uh, I don't know what I meant by measure object. Uh, anyway, don't worry about that. I'll correct that before I send it out. Um, don't forget, of course, there's lots of stuff we can do with Power CLI, Hyper V, uh, get broker stuff from the Citrix ones. So, any any further questions? Say so if you pick up the slide deck afterwards, you'll see various contact details details in there. Um, yeah, we got a question about that. If you're going to share the slide deck, or if they have to go search your Twitter feed. Uh, no, I think we. you said you were going to put a page up, did you not? Yes, I will put it up if, if you let me do it. So it depends oh, yeah, on the speakers. Absolutely. I will PDF that this evening and, uh, and, and send it on over. I hope that's been useful, folks. Excellent. So we have a, a question here, and that goes to what I told you about your self-promotion. So any solid resource on the Internet for very useful PowerShell script like remoting, Querying computers. Unfortunately, in my experience, 90% of the scripts out there doesn't work on all systems. So, do you want to tell us a little bit about your upcoming course? Well, my, my, yeah, my, my course is more about the, the troubleshooting rather than the, the, the scripting side of it. But this, this is the trouble with everything, isn't it? Is that you search for something and you find that a lot of stuff is, uh, let's say, not quite of the quality that you require. And, you know, the even because a lot of people have got GitHub repositories doesn't mean the stuff they put on GitHub is good. You know, a lot of stuff on there, the majority of what I've seen is good. So be able to just find yourself some good sources. You know, there's uh, look out particularly for the, you know, the Microsoft MVPs and Citrix CTPs because they're, they're generally people who, who know their stuff. But I will be uh, sending more details out, certainly through Twitter, about some training courses I'm thinking of running. So hopefully that my, you know, my background, as I said right at the start, in software engineering and my EUC troubleshooting brought together. Hopefully I can let uh, other people learn from that by putting some courses together. Not just this is how we write a script, but this is how we write a uh, a robust script. You know, one that checks errors, one that doesn't fall over. Excellent. One thing I would say, check error codes. Yeah. God invented error codes for a reason. Check them. 
Excellent. So you're getting a lot of great feedback here. And, and again, it's about sharing with the community, uh, at least for myself. A couple of years ago, I didn't know Guy, and now he's my uh, go-to guy for PowerShell. He's really helpful. He helped me out. So if he sees something wrong in my code, he helped me optimize it. He did this week and did it before. And now he recently just became a Citrix CDP again. So make sure, you know, join Twitter if it's just for reading and then start sharing and then boom, you go. If you want to present, ping me and we can put you up as a presenter here at the Wordle Expo as well. So for those of you that have more questions, just ping Guy on Twitter. If you go to my agenda page, you have all the presenters and the speakers and the sponsors and their name is uh, highlighted in red, which means it's a, a hyperlink that goes straight to their Twitter profile. So it's easy for you to find it there. Again, all this setting is being recorded and we're going to send out a recording next week when I'm finished processing them. And with that, we're going to take a small break. <laughs>